All righty. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for to our quarterly hearing law symposium as we review pediatric cochlear implant candidacy. Tonight's talk will include presentations including neurology, or excuse me, neurotology, audiology, and speech language pathology. Our inter interdisciplinary team at the University of Chicago Medicine takes a detailed approach in treating each patient with individualized care plans to ensure best possible outcomes. We will move through each presentation with our providers and have a Q&A session at the very end, so please hold your questions until then. We will, when we get to the end, write your questions in the chat and we'll take time to answer them. With those housekeeping items out of the way, we'll get started with our first presenter. Dr. Ted Embry is a neurotologist who specializes in treating adults and children with a wide array of ear issues. His clinical expertise includes advanced cochlear implantation techniques, radio surgery for treatment of skull-based tumors, and management of chronic ear disease. He has been published in numerous peer-reviewed journals with interest including noise-induced hearing loss, outcomes after cochlear implantation, and single-sided hearing loss. He attended medical school at Virginia Commonwealth University and completed his fellowship at the University of Virginia Health. Without further ado, take it away, Dr. Embry. All right. Thank you, Josh. Good night, everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, and again, I'm Ted Embry. I'm one of the neurotologists here at the University of Chicago Medical Center uh, section of ENT. And, um, you know, I have a strong interest in adult and pediatric cochlear implantation. So it's nice to um, go over some of the criteria for pediatric cochlear implantation tonight. You know, we decided on this talk a few months ago, and it's kind of timely now because uh, in the past couple of months, the American Cochlear Implant Alliance, the ACIA, has come out with some uh, literature and guidelines from their pediatric task force talking about pediatric cochlear implant candidacy. So uh, it's very appropriate, and we're going to highlight some of their, uh, their recent findings. And just to begin, I have no relevant disclosure, so I don't have any monetary uh, interest with any of the cochlear implant companies. Um, I will just say we also are going to be talking about off-label uh, cochlear implant indications, so just want to let you know about that. Um, so for my introduction here, I wanted to go over uh, how the current pediatric implant um, candidacy guidelines are uh, fairly restrictive, so we'll kind of talk about that and then discuss some of the quote-unquote off-label indications and the benefits for relaxed criteria in children. Uh, as we know, cochlear implants are remarkable devices for hearing rehabilitation. They have been termed the most successful sensory neuroprosthesis of all time. Uh, sort of, you know, based on the most recent data that we have from 2019, there's been approximately 740,000 uh, implants done worldwide. Uh, in America, about 118,000 for adults uh, and about 65,000 for children. One of the things that we certainly struggle with, um, you know, not just in pediatrics, but in adult cochlear implantation as well, is just sort of penetrance. And so only about five to 10% of adults who are, you know, audiometrically a candidate for implants will ultimately receive it. In children, the utilization is better uh, around 60%. And some of that is, you know, certainly because of universal newborn hearing screening. Um, but again, just kind of want to emphasize that despite the wonderful technology we have available. There's still underutilization in both adults and pediatrics. So pediatric candidacy has been unfortunately more restrictive than adults. And it's somewhat ironic because children obviously need uh, a greater access to sound for necessary speech and language development as they're growing. Uh, and over the past 30 years or so, as, co uh, as long as cochlear implants have been present, there really hasn't been much in the way of uh, pediatric uh, candidacy expansion. Uh, and the criteria essentially now are for uh, severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss. And that's, that's restrictive for these children, as we'll find. This is a timeline just kind of going over some of the milestones in terms of cochlear implants and their labeling indications uh, over the past 30 years. So when cochlear implants first came out in the mid-1980s, uh, there was no approval for children. And so children did not get the uh, approval for implants until 1990. And that was the age you had to be two or older, and you had to be profound uh, bilateral hearing loss with essentially no speech perception. Uh, in 1998, the uh, age was finally lowered a little bit, uh, conservatively down to 18 months, uh, but the degree of hearing loss and speech perception uh, requirements did not budge uh, much. So again, speech perception was bumped up a little bit to 20%. 
In 2000, they lowered the uh, range uh, age of implantation down to one year, um, and they expanded it to severe to profound hearing loss for those who were two and older. So if you were still, um, you know, in that, you know, 12 to 24 months, it had to be profound. Um, and they defined uh, labeling criteria for lack of auditory progress um, and less than 30% in terms of word scores. In 2014, you know, in the mid 2000s, no other uh, additional changes. And um, 2019, um, that's when the approval for single-sided deafness uh, came out. So um, that is also somewhat restrictive. So it's single-sided deafness for children who are five and older. Um, with less than 10 years of deafness, but still no other uh, labeling changes for speech perception. Uh, and then in 2020, the age was actually finally reduced to nine months, and that was technically only for the cochlear, uh, cochlear devices based on their trial. So uh, they have a reduced age of implantation down to nine months, but still there's been no change in the degree of hearing loss or speech perception. So you know, the Joint Committee on Infant Hearing has some recommendations that we all try to strive uh, and achieve uh, known as the 136 rule. And that's screening these children by one month, uh, having a formal evaluation and diagnosis by three months, and then receiving appropriate intervention at six months. And so um, you know, as providers, audiologists, speech language pathologists, we try to aim for that 136 rule. Um, and there's even some, you know, more research and um, push to try to get this down to a one, two, three timeline. And so it's kind of funny, you know, as we're making this big push to follow the one, three, six, or even a one, two, three type of guideline that for children, we're still waiting for an implant until nine, uh, or 12 months. Um, and so it's unfortunate because there's a lot of evidence that suggests cochlear implants can be done safely in children, even under nine months old. Um, and we have a lot of evidence that demonstrates that uh, the age of implantation, uh, so younger implantation, will yield better outcomes. So this is just kind of uh, profiling the difference between the, um, the, the criteria based on FDA uh, for the children and adults. So again, this is the least restrictive criteria, and you can kind of see the, see the shaded area. So for children, again, it's really limited to severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss, whereas adults uh, over the years have had more expanded criteria, and so we're doing more um, you know, hearing preservation or hybrid electroacoustic stimulation. And so adults uh, can have fairly good low frequency hearing. Uh, so there's much more expansion uh, for the thresholds. And so there's a lot more, uh, certainly more liberal for adults based on the profile here. Uh, this is a nice chart that was from a recent presentation uh, from the ACIA, but it just kind of combines all of the different device labeling um, indications for the three um, companies, Advanced Bionics, uh, Cochlear Corporation, as well as MedL. So as I said earlier, Cochlear has the um, indication for uh, nine months. So they can, um, so that's again, the youngest that we currently have. Uh, Advanced Bionics and MedL have to be older than one. Uh, the text that is in red indicates the uh, criteria for single-sided deafness, uh, unilateral cochlear implantation. Um, so again, that uh, age of approval is for five years and older. Um, the audiometric candidacy, again, it's pretty much bilateral profound or bilateral uh, severe to profound, um, again, for those older than two. And the speech recognition scores are slightly different among the three manufacturers, but as you can see, they're fairly restrictive. So anywhere, I mean, the most liberal is cochlear with 30 or 30% or less and others are 30, 20, um, potentially. For single-sided deafness, um, it's actually quite restrictive, so technically, um, sentence recognition has to be less than 5%. Um, there's always, you know, a recommended three to six month hearing aid trial and uh, obviously a lack of benefit with traditional hearing amplification. But again, just a nice summary slide to refer to the current uh, labeling indications. So as I illustrated, you know, there's a lot of discrepancy uh, between the three uh, manufacturers. Um, and again, the most liberal technically is the Cochlear Corporation. Uh, and as I mentioned for adults, as you saw from the, the shaded audiogram earlier, uh, much more liberalized criteria um, with the sort of hybrid or electroacoustic stimulation uh, hearing preservation uh, profiles that we see. So it's honestly kind of unreasonable to expect that children uh, are going to learn and access spoken language with um, more significant levels of hearing loss. So um, if anything, you know, the, the criteria for children should be honestly more liberal than adults. Um, 
So there's a lot of other situations for uh, pediatrics where it makes sense to be more liberal, um, as we find with adults. Uh, pediatric patients also do well with um, implantation in situations where they have significant low frequency residual hearing, um, even whether or not they end up using sort of a hybrid electroacoustic stimulation. Um, and then just kind of also getting back to the, the single sided deafness point, um, it's approved for children five and older. And so, you know, some of that's based on the, uh, the trial that, it, uh, that was conducted. And so they only included uh, patients five and older. As we know, we can implant children. Uh, safely younger than five. And it's kind of troublesome then because you, it potentially if you have a congenital single-sided deafness, uh, you have a sort of you know, narrow range of time to potentially implant them because you know, we mostly think that the auditory neuroplasticity ends around seven years old. So you pretty much have a narrow two-year window. Um, there's still a lot more that needs to be done looking at single-sided deafness, um, but certainly uh, the earlier, the better uh, seems to be uh, the best way to go. Our academy has also published a position statement recently on this, so it's also timely, uh, again, talking about pediatric candidacy and kind of the restrictive nature of it. Uh, but just a couple of quotes from their, their position statement, which is nice to reference to. Um, and they agree that early implantation will improve auditory language outcomes, and it can be done safely, uh, you know, less than 12 months old. And so children with severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss um, should receive a cochlear implant as soon as possible or practical um, down to potentially six months or so. Um, and if they have a severe to profound hearing loss, you really shouldn't delay, you know, with sort of an arbitrary uh, hearing aid trial that, you know, is ultimately not going to provide them much benefit. Um, and as they say here too, those 12 and older with more liberalized pure tone averages between 65 to 85 without appropriate auditory skill development uh, should be eligible for implantation. So it's nice to kind of have the backing of our um, American Academy of Otolaryngology also kind of pushing for more liberalized criteria for pediatric implantation. So as you kind of see, you know, all the guidelines are a bit confusing. It certainly depends on the manufacturer. Um, it's much more restrictive than adults, um, but you have to just remember that what the manufacturer and the FDA has as labeling recommendations does not equal best practice. Um, so I would say certainly here at the University of Chicago and many other um, you know, academic centers that do pediatric implants, we are performing quote unquote off-label surgery. So children that have better than severe to profound hearing loss and you know, open set speech recognition that's better than 30%, as well as you know, single-sided deafness kids who are younger than five and other kids that have more residual hearing. So, you know, one of the take homes that you'll hear from me and probably others tonight is that you really shouldn't delay referral for evaluation until they kind of get to that, you know, sort of restrictive um, labeling recommendation. So there's a lot of benefit for CI in with these relaxed criteria. This was one of the, the studies that came out a few years ago. And one of the things that came from that study um, was a 60-60 criteria. And so that was kind of a nice uh, catchphrase in terms of how to kind of think about, you know, when should we refer a patient for a pediatric patient for a cochlear implant? So for, you know, pure tone average, if the pure tone average is worse than 60 or any sort of a speech testing, speech discrimination scores that are worse than 60%, that's um, a fairly good cutoff to go by for um, you know, referral. And then more recently, again, kind of getting, um, you know, as I said earlier, the ACIA has come out with um, some recent literature and from their pediatric task force. They've kind of modified the recommendation a little bit. It's kind of similar with the 6060, but they talk about 50, 70 plus. Uh, so that's word recognition or speech score is worse than 50%, pure tone thresholds worse than 70. And then the plus refers to limited outcomes or progress with traditional hearing amplification, poor quality of life. Um, and some of those other factors will be touched on later today in the uh, other presentations. So again, when to refer, again, I think we can look at these uh, 60, 60 or 50, 70 plus criteria as a, as a pretty easy benchmark to remember uh, for, uh, you know, for referring providers as well. You know, a child has poor functional performance, uh, limited speech language growth with appropriate hearing aids and a poor quality of life, all things to consider. And really, again, there's never gonna be an inappropriate referral um, even if maybe a, a child comes to a center and has a, has a cochlear implant evaluation and they're felt not to uh, be a good cochlear implant candidate, um, it hopefully will be an educational process and the family and the patient will learn about it. Um, and, you know, at some point in the future, maybe they will be a candidate and they can, uh, you know, approach the process 
um, with a little more knowledge. So it's never, never harmful to get more information. So uh, wrapping up here, um, as I said, you know, there are some centers or some providers uh, that may, you know, adhere to these strict FDA indications. And with this approach, there's going to be many children that are going to be potentially missed um, that will continue to struggle with uh, traditional hearing uh, amplification. And looking at this kind of off-label surgery, um, a lot of people are doing it. So it's not like, you know, only a couple of people, a couple of centers, there's, there's a good number of uh, surgeons and centers that are doing this off-label surgery. So this was survey data from 2018, uh, and up to almost 80% of surgeons were performing at least some degree of off-label surgery uh, in adults and children. And so for children, uh, you know, for many were implanting children younger than 12 months, uh, or implanting children that had, you know, asymmetric hearing loss that weren't, you know, bilateral, severe to profound. So there's numerous studies that demonstrate relaxed benefit for implantation uh, in children, uh, but still utilization for cochlear implants is poor across many centers. You know, some of this may boil down to a fear of losing residual hearing, again, with these kind of more re relaxed criteria, um, perhaps a fear of being able to use other regenerative therapies in the future. But some of this really boils down to lack of awareness and, you know, you know, preferring providers, other pa patients that, um, you know, aren't at a CI center, they may not really be aware of kind of, you know, some of the benefits with these relaxed criteria and they're just relying based on the sort of the manufacturer's labeling. So again, that's one of the, the goals of tonight to kind of highlight that uh, and highlight the, uh, some of these criteria that may be a little bit uh, better to go based on, um, you know, making a referral on the 50, 70, plus or 60, 60 criteria. Um, but again, it, cochlear implants, uh, especially for children really is a, uh, depends on a lot of different factors. So again, it's not something as simple as threshold and speech understanding. Um, and as you'll see tonight, you know, we're a cochlear implant team. It really is a multidisciplinary approach and, um, you know, surgeon, audiologist, speech and language pathologist, um, et cetera. And so you'll hear from Dr. Swale from the audiology side, um, and Michelle from the speech and language pathology side, but it really is a team approach. And again, there's no harm uh, in referring a child um, with these more liberal kind of 50, 70 or 60, 60 criteria. I'm always happy to correspond via email. So my emails up here ever have any questions, um, whether it's more academic or about a patient or referral, you can certainly reach out to me. And I will stop sharing here and then transition over to Dr. Swale. Thank you very much. Uh, representing our team in audiology, let me introduce Dr. Katie Swale. She is a pediatric audiologist specializing in cochlear implantation and vestibular evaluation. She received her doctorate of audiology from Rush University and completed her audiology externship here at the University of Chicago Medicine and continues to be an incredibly important part of our pediatric hearing loss team. Without further ado, take it away, Dr. Swale. What an introduction, thank you. <laughs> so piggybacking off of that, what I wanted to talk about today is a few examples of a few of these off-label cases or recently changed criteria um, of those patients within our center. So I'm gonna give two specific examples. See, I also have no relevant disclosures. So I wanna talk about two case studies today, as well as some of the research that backs up why we want to do implantation on these patients uh, and briefly discuss how we choose which patients to implant uh, and which not to. So to begin, the first patient I want to talk about when we first met him was an eight-year-old male. He failed a hearing screening at school. And up until that point, had had no risk factors for hearing loss, had passed his newborn hearing screening, had passed any previous school screenings, um, pediatrician screenings. Um, no one really had any concern. This diagnosis sort of came out of nowhere. And he went to an outside uh, audiology office that did a full audiologic evaluation. And when cochlear implantation was indicated, that's when he came to our center in February of 2020. So this audiogram here is his pre-op detection. So if you've never seen an audiogram before, the circles represent his right ear, the X's and squares represent his left ear. 
and going from top to bottom, it's very soft sounds over to very loud sounds. So you can see the difference between the two ears is pretty substantial. In his case, his right ear has normal hearing across all pitches, low pitches, high pitches, and everywhere in between, uh, while his left ear in the very lowest booming bass tones is within normal limits. It very steeply drops off uh, into those mid and high pitch sounds. What's more important here is also his word recognition, his sentence recognition. So when his right ear is masked and taken out of the equation, that left ear could only accurately repeat 4% of words. So on that particular word list, he got one word correct. And when asked to repeat full sentences, he scored 15%. So when we think about that functionally, of course, in real life, he has his normal hearing ear on the right side that he's able to learn language, he's able to hear his peers in the classroom. But when things are noisy, when he doesn't have multiple cues to compare between his two ears, when left with only that left ear, he doesn't have the adequate access he needs in order to understand speech. So in March of 2020, right before the pandemic, we implanted this left side. Now, if I pull up that line that Dr. Embry showed of the threshold indications for approved implantation for pediatrics, he is not a candidate on paper based strictly on his detection because his hearing is too good on the one side in those low pitches. Well, we can see by his word recognition, he's not getting adequate access in order to really use the hearing that he has. So we moved forward with cochlear implantation and these detection scores are from his second follow-up after activation on the right. And then this, these word recognition scores are from his most recent visit. So the L's are him with you, his processor using his cochlear implant and the X's and squares are his residual hearing. So even after an electrode was placed, he retained a lot of the hearing he had, uh, but with his processor using the implant, he has far better access than he did before. And now um, his most recent visit, that would have been about a year and a half after implantation, his word recognition was 54%. In compared to the 4% he started with, that's a huge improvement. Uh, full sentence recognition, he scored 74%. Compared to the 15% beforehand, that's also a huge, huge improvement. When it comes to functionally, again, he has this good ear on the other side. It's not that he needs it so much for communication, but the improvement he's shown is pretty, pretty uh, substantial. Uh, and he is not the only one, of course, with this change to uh, FDA guidelines for cochlear and for med -L. With single-sided deafness cases, there has been a lot of research in this area. This is just one systematic review that does a good job of summarizing these benefits. But what they have found is that children show clinically meaningful improvement in speech perception, both in noise and in quiet. Their sound localization is improved. For these patients with single-sided deafness, that's a huge area for them um, of concern initially that we can uh, improve with cochlear implantation. Uh, and they also found that patients with acquired single-sided deafness with a shorter duration of deafness showed greater improvements than their peers with congenital single-sided deafness. That's to be expected, as we know, in general, with a shorter duration of deafness, uh, outcomes are going to be better because that nerve has still been stimulated recently. It's not, we're not worried about it atrophying or not responding the way we want it to. The next patient I want to talk about when we first met her, uh, she was seven. Her family had recently relocated from Yemen and she was trying to start school within the public school system and she had no speech and language. And so they're trying to set up what educational situation is most appropriate for her. Um, and 
they didn't know. We didn't know. So we quickly did an ABR, which showed us she has bilateral auditory neuropathy, which means that her auditory nerve, which we talk about as if it's one thing, um, is actually hundreds of nerve fibers that are supposed to be working together. But in her case, um, they're not synchronized. They're not working as a team to give her brain the strong, clear signal of sound. So first we implanted her left ear. These scores here are from shortly after we um, implanted the left side. So those C's are with her processor on the left side. Um, and the circles are her right ear before we implanted that side. But her ears were relatively um, symmetrical as far as her ability to detect sound. So you can see again, some significant improvement in detection. Now with her, uh, her family relocating from Yemen, they use Arabic in the home and she is learning English in school, but a lot of our speech based tests were, wouldn't be appropriate for her developmentally or where she is with language. So we can't rely on those. Again, if I pull up those uh, FDA guidelines for pediatrics, she would not be a candidate in her right side. However, we know through an extensive hearing aid trial in her case that hearing aids were not providing the amplification, the clear signal that she needs in order for speech and language to be understood. So first we implanted her left ear, then her right ear. These thresholds are from her most recent visit um, when she has since unfortunately uh, been one of the patients who needed a revision surgery on her cochlear implant. So her left side was revised in August and this is where she is now. So her detection from where she came in greatly improved. While we can't rely on the same standardized speech testing that we do for our typical patients, I can say subjectively, she's shown huge improvements in her confidence and her social engagement. She's starting to learn language. Uh, I keep this picture of our AB monkey in here because uh, shortly after she was implanted on her first side, uh, she came in for testing and unprovoked, unprompted, very proudly told me that those were the letters A and B. And she could identify those on her own, which is something she couldn't do before. Um, and that's a huge, huge jump for her. Again, big area of research when it comes to children with auditory neuropathy, what are their best outcomes? And this systematic review, again, does a better job of summarizing all of the benefits of it, including that every study they included reported significant hearing improvement in speech perception skills. And nearly all of the studies uh, that looked at them or compared the two groups found that their hearing skills were comparable to patients with sensory neural hearing loss using cochlear implants. So their detection, their speech discrimination, and their speech recognition over time ends up looking very similar to patients with more typical sensory neural hearing loss, um, even though their initial presentation can be quite different. So when it comes to implanting patients younger than 12 months or with that recent change younger than nine months, we don't have an example of that from our center, uh, but there is quite a bit of research um, in this area, this is another systematic review. And they found that the best evidence showed that early implanted children scored better on speech production, auditory performance, and on two out of the five receptive language scores that they compared between these groups. Their uh, critiques of the study were that a lot of these included articles very small sample sizes or even individual case studies. And we don't have some of the long-term data for these uh, younger, early implanted patients. So can we say that patient, their, their finding was, can we say that patients who are early implanted do well with cochlear implants? Absolutely. Do they do significantly better 
than their patients who are implanted at 12 months or shortly after 12 months. Comparing those two, we don't quite have strong enough evidence to answer that question yet. So how do we decide when we should and should not implant? Um, even when these patients don't fit FDA guidelines. So we use a tool called CHIP, the Children's Cochlear Implant Profile. And what it is is a rating system that separates specialties or areas of interest to be sure that we're looking at these patients, not just by any one of these profiles or any one of these concerns, but addressing them all as a full person. So this is a, the, the full form, but we use it more to guide our discussions during our biweekly hearing loss team meetings, where we have representatives from otolaryngology, audiology, speech pathology, social work, um, and when we can, education as well, uh, whether that's in person within our meetings or through offline discussions with educational audiologists, with educational speech paths, teachers, um, you know, whoever we can really get involved, we try to. And this isn't to say that if we mark some concern or great concern that discounts them from getting an implant, it just guides our discussion about where our focus areas for our rehab afterwards or where our focus areas we need to be sure that education is put in place for this family, for this patient, that they really know what they're in for and that they're gonna be an ideal candidate. As Dr. Embry said, there are some restrictive uh, guidelines for FDA approval when it comes to pediatric cochlear implants, but there are plenty of examples of patients who are outside of those guidelines who not only greatly benefit from their cochlear implant, uh, but are not greatly benefiting from hearing aids beforehand. Um, let's see, oh, here are my references. <laughs> um, and just to summarize, to say that uh, beyond these examples, these are just two that I thought best highlighted these, but we have plenty of examples within our uh, clinic of patients who greatly benefit from their cochlear implants. Uh, whether or not they, they meet these very strict criteria beforehand, um, even with the recent 2020 changes. Okay. All right. So I'll pass it off to uh, virtual Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> virtual Michelle, indeed. Representing our team in speech language pathology, let me introduce Michelle Hadlick. She is a certified speech language pathologist who specializes in listening and spoken language development in children with hearing loss. She obtained her Master of Health Science degree in Communication Disorders from Governor State University in 2006 and has worked at the University of Chicago Medicine and been on the pediatric cochlear implant team since 2009. She became a certified audio, auditory verbal therapist in 2014 and has been credentialed as an early intervention specialist since 2007. All right, and take it away, Michelle. Give me just a second. Hello, I'm Michelle. I'm the speech language pathologist and auditory verbal therapist that will be discussing listening and spoken language and how it factors into deciding to refer for implant candidacy. I have nothing to disclose. Today we'll be talking uh, this evening about what warrants a CI referral from a speech and language and audition and quality of life perspective. Uh, discussing why a CI should not be considered a last resort and talk about how to reduce the impact of hearing loss on listening and spoken language development. So we've already discussed the 50, 70 plus 
referral criteria that ACIA a task force has recently rolled out so perfectly timed with our planned talk for this evening. We've talked about it from a medical and audiology perspective, and we've seen compelling evidence that off-label and less stringent guidelines should be considered for children with hearing loss that aren't benefiting from their hearing aids. Sometimes these off-label cases are identified more by their functional performance or lack thereof than the numbers on an audiogram. So for the remainder of our discussion this evening, we will be talking about that plus portion in this 5070 plus criteria to help identify the children who may benefit from a referral for a CI. So whenever we have these conversations, we want to really think about it through the lens of what's the family's goal? So it's likely safe to say that anyone that's considering a cochlear implant candidacy evaluation wants some measure of auditory skill development for their child and wants spoken language to be at least a part of their communication mode if appropriate. As providers, like I said, we wanna look through the lens of what's the desired communication mode when counseling families regarding CI candidacy. So it would make sense that the criteria for auditory and language skill development should be an aspect of when to refer because that's the very skill that we want to see change for the better with any kind of hearing device fitting. So again, what's the family's goal? Do we want to see improved spoken language? Do we want, do they want total communication, which is spoken language and manual sign language together and listening? Do they want just improved quality of life, sound awareness of safe, uh, for safety? Maybe they have a child that has other de uh, developmental disabilities, but yet hearing could be a strength for them if they are fitted correctly. So there's a spectrum of outcomes and approaches family can choose that, and that are appropriate depending on the child's history. But if the desire of the family is for any sort of auditory development and spoken language development, then it beho behooves us as providers to monitor these skills closely in children who have hearing aids so we can document if we have reason to think that they are fully bedding benefiting from their current devices. And why is this? Because no matter the desired auditory or spoken language outcome, research shows earlier is better when it comes to ensuring optimal auditory access in order for a child to reach their fullest listening and spoken language potential. So how can we intervene early if we aren't even tracking their auditory and spoken language skills and the rate in which they're improving? We cannot wait for every three-year eval by then they will have fallen further behind. So what factors, one of the things that will help us um, determine this, oh, I went, skipped a slide, sorry, is that plus factor. So um, the ACIA task force defined the plus in this 5070 plus as how um, their limited progress is, poor quality of life and poor functional performance. But how do we determine and that and what checks and balances should be in place to monitor these areas. First, we have to look at what might be contributing to their slow progress and figure out what we can change. So these, this slide should be familiar, a list to most of you about what can contribute to slow progress in addition to poor auditory benefit from hearing aids. Some things we can control, some we can't. But as providers and parents of children with hearing loss, we have a responsibility to ensure that what we can control for is addressed, especially consistent device use and consistent attendance and therapy, because it's very hard for us to determine, any of us on the team, that the child is really not progressing or meeting their potential because of poor access with their hearing aids if they're not wearing them or if they're not attending therapy, if they're not in a language rich environment. There's so many factors, it's hard to figure out what is the main contributing factor. Some of this we can't control for, but it makes that um, process easier for everyone if you can uh, address these. And the other issues, that doesn't mean that they won't be a CI candidate, but it's a holistic approach to look at the whole child, the whole family situation, especially for counseling families on what expectations and outcomes from a cochlear implant would be appropriate if they're found to be a candidate. And for these off-label or less traditional candidates, it can be really murky and hard to determine, are they a candidate? So ACIA gave some um, guidelines on things that providers and parents can observe to help um, monitor that they are uh, progressing slowly or not, or not as expected. So for example, if they have additional diagnosis, are they bonding with their device? 
is the child's affect or social engagement uh, improving or changing with and without the devices on? That can give us a gauge of whether um, they're benefiting from their current devices. Same thing with NSD, difficult to determine because there's fluctuations in their performance or often they perform worse than what's on the page, um, what the numbers are on their audiometric thresholds. Same with single-sided deafness. They're gonna have sometimes typical sounding language and speech yet they may be having subtle difficulties that give them more um, of a struggle in school than really is necessary for example difficulty with sound localization they break down in noise they have an attention or fatigue or effort uh, increased effort in hearing so should hearing uh, considering a cochlear implant with these cases where kids are struggling you see poor outcomes and limited um, progress should this be considered an absolute last resort and wait for those that poor progress and that limited progress absolutely not a wait and see approach should not be uh, the way to go why is this because hearing loss in children is considered a neurodevelopmental emergency as most of you know birth to three maybe birth to five even that's stretching it is really a critical language learning period the brain is just ready to soak up language and it sets the foundation for later language speech spelling reading writing think, critical thinking skills the ears are the doorway to the brain if those doors are closed the sound and language are not getting to this developing brain and it's hard to have a foundation of spoken language to build upon if that signal that auditory signal is not clear intact and optimized. To give a side note uh, to help you under uh, kind of get this concept, all of you in the audience think about if you speak another language, did you learn it as a child incidentally in a bilingual household or did you have to do it like I did and take a couple semesters in French um, just to check off that foreign language credit? My my lack of uh, training and, and the effort I had to put in and I definitely don't sound like a native speaker and all of that because my brain in high school was way more solid as opposed to a child. If you learned a second language as a child, you more likely are fluent and also sounding more like a native speaker. It's the same thing with a first language. The earlier the developing brain is exposed to an excellent model of spoken language, the easier it is for them to have skills that are same or as strong as they can be. Same as their same age hearing peers or as strong as they, they could be in the ideal setting. Um, the longer they go without good access auditory to language, the harder it is to catch up, to close the gap, and less likely it is that they're going to sound like their peers with regard to speech production and voicing. This requires an excellent auditory access through the use of hearing aids for children with hearing loss, but sometimes um, the hearing aids are not giving enough auditory access and that's why we have things like the speech banana that you might be familiar with that documents where sounds fall on an audiogram but we don't want children to be hearing somewhere in the speech banana we want them to hear all of it and this is illustrated really well by dr jane medell who coined the term speech string bean, which is to quote, for children to have sufficient auditory access, they need to hear in the string bean at the top of the banana. That means thresholds at 20 to 25 dB throughout the frequency range. That's, let's remember that soft speech is at 30 to 35 dB HL. So we don't wanna be satisfied with just hearing some of the banana. We wanna hear at the top of the banana. And when children do not hear all those speech sounds with their hearing aids, their audition, their speech, their language skills often lag. And that's where you start to see those limited progress, poor functional outcomes, because it's reflected by the fact that they don't have access to all the sounds they need to in the, in the developing brain. That's when you start to see delays, fatigue, difficulty with auditory memory, difficulty in noise. They break down when there's a distance or they have behavioral concerns, social academic concerns. So as was discussed already with our prior speakers, there's a problem with the FDA guidelines because if we were to always strictly follow the current FDA guidelines for children, they would not be hearing at the speech string bean, so to speak. That's why it's so important to keep watching that 5070 plus. Um, 
I know I'm not okay hearing only 30% of conversation. I doubt that you are okay hearing 30% of conversation. So why would we be okay with that before considering another option like a cochlear implant eval to see would that give them a larger um, access to all the sounds for speech so that their developing brain can um, meet their potential for listening and spoken language outcomes. Um, so it is not okay for the developing brain to only hear 30%, for example, of sentences, words, and speech, and you, in order to expect spoken language outcomes. So to avoid this emergency, there's some great longitudinal studies of children with hearing loss that show that when these things are put together, um, they, you can have really nice outcomes. Children are more likely to meet their fullest listening and spoken language uh, potential. But we all, parents, providers, everyone on the team has to do the work to make sure that these key parts are happening, especially full-time use of the device that they're currently wearing. And, um, and sorry, I lost my place in my slide. Um, and also, to monitor that progress so that we're catching them as they fall behind as soon as possible. Parents, you can do your part by doing these things, especially providing a language rich environment and making sure they're wearing their devices and you're going to therapy regularly to monitor their progress. Um, encouraging regular audiology visits, the providers, again, helping the parents create that language rich environment and wear those devices. But especially, this is a key part, Children should be making month for month progress or faster. And you won't know that unless you are including dynamic assessment of their functional skills in those domains on a regular basis. And if it's not happening, we need to ask ourselves as provider why and act on that sooner than later because of this critical language learning period we want to cap uh, capitalize on. What do we do at University of Chicago to address these things? Um, children, as soon as they're identified with a hearing loss, we um, make sure that they get a speech eval, they're referred to good services. We see them regularly to monitor and make sure they're making month to month progress. What does that mean? That means if a child has been wearing hearing aids for three months, I'm sorry, for six months, and they've only made three months progress, that is not sufficient. They're gonna fall further and further behind. They should make at least six months progress in six months of hearing time. Sorry, my slides are acting a little funny. Um, there's a lag here, sorry. So we we'll also do co-treats with audiology for hard to test children to ensure optimal benefits from hearing devices. We check them annually to make sure they're making year to year progress. Again, not waiting for an IEP every three years to show, oops, they're two years behind. Any children with slower limited progress are flags, and we discuss whether an implant should be considered. We'll even provide short-term therapy for those hard-to-test children to teach them how to be more reliable in the booth, tell us what they're hearing or not, so that we can be clear that they are benefiting from their devices or not. So again, what are we looking for? Make, not making progress full time, with full-time use of good um, devices, not making month-to-month -month gains, slow speech and language development compared to their hearing age and their nonverbal intelligence. Here are some other things we've talked about already that we want to be looking for that would tell us we need to think about an implant referral. Why are they not um, doing better? Providers are responsible to do this monitoring and refer as um, soon as they see slower limited progress. Sorry. Parents, um, again, full-time use of devices, continue regular attendance and therapy and, and audiology visits, and ask yourself, if you feel your child could be doing better, ask the, the um, medical uh, provider that you're seeing and the audiologist is uh, pursuing cochlear implant candidacy because of these poor functional outcomes, poor progress, or poor quality of life factors that are listed here, uh, and just see. So the key takeaways are earlier is better. It's not a last resort. Um, keep thinking about that 50, 70 plus with any children that are on your caseload. Do they qualify in any of those three areas? And they're really, like was mentioned earlier, no inappropriate referrals. Here's uh, 
my references and also uh, I'll provide my contact information as soon as my slide changes. Um, I'm always happy to discuss cases that you might have specific questions about and um, I will, I just thank you for listening. Have a good evening. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Severe to wrap up and answer any other questions you may have. Have a good night. All right, thank you, Michelle. So that concludes our talk for tonight. We're gonna to have a recording of this presentation tonight on our YouTube page, which is U Chicago Ear and Hearing. We're gonna start posting all of our quarter, quarterly symposium talks on that page. So definitely find it there. And we will also post the links and all our other social media pages in the next day or two. With that done, I'm gonna turn it over. And if anybody has any questions they would like to ask, please put them in the chat and we will ask our providers.